When Alexander the Great died mysteriously and suddenly in 323 BC at the age of only 32, the entire classical world that he had dominated for more than a decade was thrown into uncertainty about what would happen next. Because he had left no official successor and his wife Roxana was still pregnant with his child when he died, there was nobody designated to step into his shoes and take up the job of holding the vast dominion together. But there was a group of men who knew that his death presented a great opportunity for their own rise to power, Alexander's generals. With the king gone, the path to civil war seemed inevitable, but any conflict between the generals would have to wait until after Alexander had been officially put to rest. The events surrounding the treatment of Alexander's body after his death were strange and controversial from the very start. To start with, a debate arose among Alexander's inner circle over what to do with the king's corpse. The typical tradition for handling the death of a Macedonian king would be to cremate his body in a royal funeral ceremony, but that could only happen back in his homeland of Macedonia. In order to make sure that the body could be transported out from Babylon and brought to this final resting place, it was decided that Alexander would be embalmed in a typical Egyptian style. After his body was embalmed, Alexander's mummified corpse was anointed with perfumes and honey. Then it was placed in a golden coffin lined with herbs. The sarcophagus was draped in a purple cover. Once the body was finished being prepared, a new debate quickly arose among Alexander's marshals. What exactly should happen to the great king next? The primary source of the tension was because in Macedonian tradition, great honor was given to the man who buried a king. Whoever oversaw Alexander's burial would likely be accepted as his legitimate successor. It took nearly two years for a final decision to be made regarding how the empire would be divided and where Alexander's body would rest. During this time, Alexander's body remained in Babylon. Finally though, it was decided to bury Alexander in the Egyptian city of Siwa inside a temple dedicated to Zeus Amun, the god with whom Alexander claimed to be descended from. But just as it seemed that there was finally a plan for the king's body to at last be put to rest, his general Ptolemy made a daring move. Despite the agreement to move Alexander to Siwa, Ptolemy had begun to hear rumors that another general named Perdiccas had different plans in mind for the funeral cart. He believed that his rival general really intended to bring Alexander back to Aegea in Macedonia, which was a location that would support Perdiccas' own bid for power. Deciding that he couldn't wait to see if the rumors were true, Ptolemy struck. Using a small group of armed men, he organized an ambush of the carriage only a few days after it left Babylon. Once his men had controlled the convoy, they redirected the carriage south into Egypt, where Ptolemy was ruling. They brought the body to the city of Memphis. Once the body was in Memphis, Ptolemy knew that he had to work quickly before Perdiccas invaded and took back the corpse. In order to secure his legitimacy, Ptolemy hastily organized a funeral in Memphis according to all the traditional Macedonian rites. His boldness paid off and he was able to succeed in burying Alexander in a way that maintained his support among the Macedonian forces, also guaranteed his new position as Alexander's official successor in Egypt. The last piece of the puzzle for Ptolemy to solidify the legitimacy of his own rule relied on how he treated Alexander's body. He had buried the king in the city of Memphis, but now he needed to give him a resting place more worthy of the greatest conqueror the Mediterranean world had ever seen. There was no more fitting place to build such a monument than in the city that kept the conqueror's name, Alexandria. Ptolemy spent much of the rest of his reign before he died in the winter of 283 BC preparing the mausoleum for Alexander's reburial as well as constructing a religious cult to worship the dead ruler. Unfortunately, despite his best efforts, the first ruler, the new dynasty, did not get to oversee the completion of his work. Instead, it fell to his son, Philadelphus to bring Alexander to what was supposed to be his final resting place. In 215 BC, Philadelphus' grandson, Ptolemy Philopater, built yet another tomb for the body of Alexander. This new mausoleum was designed so that it could also be shared by all future Ptolemy rulers after their own burials. It picked up the name Soma, meaning the body in Greek, and it was said to be located in the very heart of Alexandria. 
reminding the public of the Ptolemy's connections to Alexander the Great achieved its purpose in solidifying the authority of their rule. Unfortunately for the new dynasty though, the power games hadn't ended. Legitimacy meant nothing for the Ptolemies if they could not hold on to their control of Egypt. This would become increasingly difficult in the coming decades with a new power rising in the world, the Roman Empire. One of the great legacies of Alexander's conquest that he could never have anticipated in his own life was how his great successes would set the stage for the next empire that would replace and surpass his own. It is almost a historical certainty that if Alexander the Great had not come first, the Roman Republic and later empire could never have reached the heights of control and power that it had achieved a few hundred years after his death. The spread of Hellenistic culture through Greek language, art, and philosophy that Alexander facilitated became like the cement that the Romans used to hold together their own bricks of conquest across the Mediterranean world. The union between Greek and Roman culture that became one of the defining cultural traits of Roman power had its origin in Alexander's empire, and the Romans realized this fact. And with this key influence over their empire evident, it's not surprising that Romans chose to regularly pay homage to Alexander at his magnificent Soma tomb. After Octavian defeated Cleopatra and Mark Antony officially made Egypt part of the empire, one of the first things he did was visit Alexander's tomb. Octavian paid his respects to the king by placing a golden crown on his sarcophagus, covering the grave with flowers. He was so impressed by what he saw that when he eventually died, his own tomb was said to have been designed to look like the mausoleum in Alexandria. This started a pattern for future Roman emperors after Octavian as the Romans saw themselves not as literal heirs of Alexander like the Ptolemies had, but as more of spiritual successors to the great conqueror. And we have a long list of emperors who visited Alexander's tomb over the years. Almost all the rulers used the chance to have a public visit to the king, harness the popularity of Alexander's legacy as a tool to support their own power, much as the Ptolemies had centuries before. But over the decades, as the Roman Empire changed, the tomb of Alexander faced ruin and decline. And then in the year 365, a disaster hit Alexandria that acted as a death blow for the preservation of the tomb. And the city was hit by a huge earthquake, followed not long after by a tidal wave that destroyed much of Alexandria. From then on, it passed out of all history, becoming more part of legend and myth than real historical record. Over the next 1500 years, almost nothing can be known for certain about Alexander's body or where the tomb might hide within the ruined city. Some theories say that the body might have been moved to a different city, others think it could still lie beneath the ruins of Alexandria. That doesn't mean the search has stopped or the desire to uncover the tomb of the lost king has faded. But now in our modern times, we might be at the edge of yet another history-changing discovery. This is primarily due to the fascinating work of one particular individual, a Greek archaeologist named Calliope Limnius Papacosta. For almost 15 years, Calliope has led a team excavating at a site in Alexandria. In 2018, right as she was on the verge of giving up the search, a piece of white marble was uncovered poking out from the ground. The statue uncovered was none other than that of Alexander himself. And then not long after the statue, Calliope's team unearthed part of the ancient city of Alexandria's original foundation. It was determined that they were digging right in the historic city's royal quarters, dating back all the way to the city's founding, the time of Alexander himself. Today, almost seven years after this first great discovery, Calliope and her team seem to be inching closer and closer to what might be the greatest archaeological find since King Tut. They've dug almost 35 feet down and continue to unearth lost sections of the city's royal quarter, including a Roman road and the remains of a massive public building that might have served visitors traveling on pilgrimage to see Alexander's tomb. The work has been extremely difficult and slow moving because the city of Alexandria is slowly sinking by almost a quarter of a centimeter each year the team has fashioned an elaborate system of pumps and hoses to keep the site dry. But as the years of work add up, Calliope has become even more optimistic that the discovery she's searched for her whole life might just be beneath the ground where she digs. 
And it's hard to underestimate the impact the uncovering of Alexander's tomb might be. There'd be fascinating historical and archaeological knowledge gained about both the Macedonian and Egyptian cultures of the time. Now, the rest of the story will play out as anyone's guess, but I can't help but get excited about the possibility of potentially getting some answers on this 1,500-year-old mystery.